Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so, I know quite a few people in the room, but not everybody. So, uh, Deborah Lafer from the Center for Urban Science and Progress here at NY, uh, NYU. Delighted to have everyone and to be able to co sponsor this event. Before we move on to the really good stuff, I have a little bit of housekeeping. So, um, in case a fire drill or some other need to quickly leave this auditorium, you'll see that there are two exits in the back and one to the side as well. The bathrooms are straight out to the back and to your right, just before the main lobby of the men's and the women's room. Uh, you are very welcome to tweet this event if you would like, but I would just kindly remind everyone to turn their ringers off. So we're very excited to have a, a, a really packed schedule today. So I will go ahead and introduce our master of ceremonies and really uh, one of the moving forces, not only behind this event, uh, but behind GIS here in the city, uh, Mr. Alan Leitner, president of Gizmo. Thank you, uh, Professor Lapper, Deborah, as I've come to know you. Uh, and I would say that we're extraordinarily grateful for uh, Professor Laffer making available this terrific auditorium and also for the collaboration we've had with her at NYU for the last years, which I, I very much hope will continue into the future. Um, just a couple of things before we go to our first presenter, which will be uh, uh, Andy Cochran of the Department of City Planning. Um, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce those members of the Gizmo Board of Directors who are here. So uh, if you would stand if you're here, and otherwise I'll just mention your name, is Jack Eichenbaum, who is the founder of Gizmo and on the board. Um, <laughs> Three years of engagement uh, with the GIS community through Gizmo. Um, Jim Wen of EDC is newly elected on the board of directors. Doug Williamson of the New York Police Department who couldn't be here today, but he's on the board now. Juliana Manate, uh, uh, who's had the program at Lehman College, the GIS program at Lehman. She was newly elected as a board member. Wendy Dorf, who's out by the door right now, I think, um, and has been a long time involved in GIS and is now uh, many years at CEP <laughs> and is now uh, director of uh, GeoCats. Amy Ju, who's back at the end, uh, back in the auditorium with the camera. Dara Mendeloff of Columbia University in Size and Lab. And Noreen Weisel, who's head of Cogito uh, for Gizmo, which is a coalition of geospatial organizations across the city. So um, we've got a real powerful board uh, that's influential and has lots of connections all over the place. And, um, you know, welcome to this event which is sort of like a, a foundational event for Gizmo because it is what Gizmo stands for, which is bringing people together, collaborating, and exchanging ideas and exchanging data. We've been doing this for the past 30 years, since 1990, since we were founded, and we want to do it for another 30 years. In the spring, we will be celebrating our 30th anniversary, so um, maybe I can convince everyone here who is not a Gizmo member to pay $20 and become a Gizmo member and we see us through our 30th year. It'd be great to have a uh, greater representation from city agencies. Um, and in particular, because we're very ambitious this year in that we are trying to advance a legislative agenda. Um, that agenda includes a mandate that there be a GIO appointed to coordinate GIS in the city, which we haven't had since I was a GIO pretty much, um, and that was a long time ago. Uh, the development of a GIS strategic plan for the entire city and the development of a steering committee to guide GIS policy made up of the points of contacts of all agencies that have GIS programs. So I think it will be well worth it to you, especially if you work with the city, to become a Gizmo member and help us put this agenda through. And I hope that in a couple of weeks, we will have very positive news about advancement of that initiative. 
So stay tuned for that. And you know, always visit your Gizmo uh, website, gizmonyc.org, uh, for the latest information. And also, if you want to join, um, you know, you can join up uh, at that website. And again, it's twenty dollars a year uh, for membership, not only in the city city Gizmo, but it also pays for membership in the New York State GIS Association. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so um, I think with that, we will call up um, our first speaker, um, Andy Cochran, director of New York City Planning Lab, to discuss open application development for open geospatial data. So, Andy, welcome. Uh, so, um, I'm Andy Cochran. I'm the director of NYC Planning Labs at the Department of City Planning. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit uh, about uh, our processes for building web applications and, um, and uh, what we sort of do with open data. Uh, so, um, um, Planning Labs is a, a modern development team at the, at the Department of City Planning. Um, so we're, we embrace um, open technology, agile development, um, and user-centered design. Um, and we build products uh, with the planners at the agency um, to improve sort of like the, the decision making that happens at, at the agency. Um, you'll see we're, we're structured with three sort of core disciplines, uh, being engineering, design, and product. Um, it's, it's really, uh, we, we started off as three people, uh, and when we were three, uh, we were a, an engineer, a designer, and sort of a, a, a lead uh, who sort of drove the product vision. Um, so this has sort of been from the beginning. Uh, we were set up with, um, with uh, design, engineering, and product uh, at, the, at the core of what we do. Um, so uh, this isn't everyone that allows us to do what we do. Um, at the Department of City Planning, you are probably all aware that we have uh, a, a wealth of open data, and um, the, the work that we've done probably wouldn't be possible uh, without, uh, without, without that. Um, we have an enterprise data management team uh, who does incredible work, and they share a lot of the same uh, values that I'm about to talk to you about today. So um, we'll start with a problem statement. A lot of times, government uh, technology products take a long time. Um, they're, they can be really expensive, and uh, they don't always have the best user experience. Um, so, how do we address this problem? Um, we, we address this by using uh, free and, or cheap and open source software. Um, and we focus on delivering solutions as uh, soon as possible. So we'll do some research and make some assumptions and build something nascent uh, to, to test um, and to test those assumptions, and then um, uh, deploy that as early as possible. And then we'll get feedback and iterate. Um, if you're, you're you're probably aware of Mike Bracken from uh, Gov.uk. Uh, he always says uh, the the strategy is delivery. So like that's we we find that to be key is like constant delivery of like releasing things as soon as we can. Uh, but it all starts with design thinking. Um, you know, like I said, like in the uh, in the very beginning, like since our uh, since we started, you know, a design, a design was a third of the team, and that's crucial to what we do. Uh, we like to say how we build is as important as what we build. That's sort of our mantra. Um, so there are tons of problems that we could be solving. Uh, but uh, we are selective about what we choose to spend our time on because we're limited, we're a small team. Um, so what we're trying to do is bring the most value we can to the agency. Um, and how we go about that is, um, it, uh, comes down to our core values. And uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, like, there are other divisions that are crucial in this work. There are uh, also other development teams at City Planning, not just the, the eight of us. But um, what we, as we've uh, sort of built these practices, we're sharing them with the other teams in the, at the agency that are building software too. So we're trying to sort of build this movement. Um, so uh, what are our core values? We're open by default. So this, what this means is that our code is open, our process is open, 
Uh, we try to be as, as transparent as possible. Um, so we also, we say build with, not for. Um, we're building with the users of our products and uh, not for them, which means that uh, we don't just get requirements, throw it over the fence, and we go away for a while, build something, and then bring it back to them and say, done, ta-da. Uh, we, uh, you know, they're, they're a sort of like, our users or subject matter experts around the agency are working with us and uh, they're embedded in, in the process and they're, they're crucial to, uh, to the success of what we do. Um, so again, we're also, we're constantly deploying. Um, we'll often like dream up some sort of uh, API or um, uh, idea for an app in the morning and like deploy it by the afternoon and then just like start iterating on it. Um, but also, uh, we document and disseminate, and uh, this is this is this is crucial. Uh, we'll you know we'll blog, we'll tweet, uh, we'll share all the lessons that we learn along the way, and uh, we probably wouldn't be as effective without others coming before us having done the same. So um, again, we use free and open source software. This is uh, on the left. This is this is GitHub. Uh, so all of our all of our code is 100% open source, and you can go on GitHub, GitHub and see like every line of code we've ever written. Uh, you can look at the source, you can sort of uh, you can copy what we've done and use it for yourself. Um, we use agile methodologies. So, um, we're, we choose the problems that we're going to solve by proactively talking to the, the various business units in the agency. Um, very often they'll come to us with a big idea for an app. Uh, when that happens, we like to um, ask a lot, of, a lot of questions to try to identify the problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, so, um, we, we we're calling this a, a path analysis, and we'll figure out like how do we how do we fit that into our future roadmap? Because there's so many things we could be doing. Uh, but it's important to like uh, to separate the the problem from any assumed solutions. Many people come to us with ideas for apps, but what, what we want to do is like get that down to like what's the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, so, um, once we decided to, to tackle a problem, we'll uh, we work in, a, in an agile method where we. Um, are doing regular sprints, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll plan our work, we'll do a daily stand-up where every day we talk about what we've done and what's blocking us, and then at the end of that, we will have, uh, have a review and then a retrospective and talk about how we can make our process better. Uh, should, should, we, uh, should we launch this thing or show it to people? Um, but yeah, that's all. And again, at the core is the human-centered design. Um, when we're building products with uh, with our partners, we will uh, we'll you know we'll often like spend a half day uh, lock ourselves in a room with bagels and coffee and then just do a lot of design exercises to really get at the core of the problem we're trying to solve. And um, we the the goal there is to identify the who uh, we're trying to solve the problem for, what their goal is, and then what their motivation is. Uh, so we like to use this um, this format for uh, defining those three things. And once we have that, uh, we, we can use this sort of phrasing to frame, um, to frame every single feature that we want to build. So that like, the, uh, the, the end user is always at the core of what we're trying to do. Uh, we like to say demos, not memos. So we, we, every, at the end of every week, we, uh, we, sh we show what we're doing. You know, it's uh, very often uh, not working yet or uh, bad, uh, but you know, um, it's often broken. Uh, but you know, like people come to the next demo and they see the progress, and they're part of that process, and uh, they're offering valuable insight uh, as as we build things and iterate. Uh, like I like to say that if you think you need to know, if you think you know what you need to build before you build it, you're wrong. So uh, it's it's important to reconsider everything all the whole way through the process. So uh, I just want to show you quickly a few products uh, that we're, we're able to build with, with the wealth of open data that we sit on top of. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with, with, with some of these. Um, it's our flagship product, Zola, um, where you're able to, you know, at a high level, see how the, the city is zoned, or you can zoom down to the, uh, to the tax lot level and see exactly what's happening in this, in this space. Um, it's really good for like, making this data transparent. Uh, this is community district profiles. It's a this in this app we built this app so that uh, that communities can uh, understand their uh, assumptions that they're making about about themselves and know uh, what it is that that is uh, tr that's truly happening uh, in their 
um, in their communities. Uh, so there are these these uh, indicators here where you can you you, you may assume that um, your neighborhood uh, is a is, have, is facing a certain problem, but uh, in if you see that like the reality of it may, may be actually different. So uh, this is Metro Region Explorer. Uh, it, it it this is a this is a great aggregation of all the data that's happening or all all the data that's in the entire region and like planning for New York City is not uh, not done in isolation but it's connected to uh, to everything around here. So um, this is a, a very like narrative story that can you can walk through and really see, uh, get a uh, glimpse of what's really happening in the region. Uh, this is Population Fact Finder. Uh, it's a really cool tool for uh, aggregating study areas for uh, census data. Uh, for, yeah, census data. So you can by uh, by the tract or or uh, or block. Even you can assemble an area. and We'll do all that aggregation for you and give you census data um, for your study area. And uh, this is the the, the most uh, recent thing we're working on: the zoning application portal, uh, where we're making uh, the process of. Uh, of applying for zoning changes more transparent and accessible and um, uh, paperless. So uh, keep an eye on the space, it's changing a lot and moving quickly. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's all I had to talk about. That's uh, all of our products and that's about, about how we work. So thank you. DMI, and I have Tim Keen with me, and one of our senior uh, developers. Uh, so today, we're not for this presentation. We're not necessarily focusing on a specific application, but I wanted to uh, kind of highlight some of our current projects that we've been working on in the past year. Um, is kind of a slice of what we're working on, um, and give you a sense of what um, services and data products you might be seeing coming your way. So, in terms of our big kind of key current initiatives that we're working on right now. Uh, we're working on developing a new hosting um, hosting environment. Right now, um, all of the data services that you rely on from Doit, like GeoClient or any of our base map timeline services or ortho imagery services are served via um, kind of an on-prem um, environment and we're looking to transition to a new platform. Um, we'll talk about some enhancements to our core JavaScript um, mapping library called NYC Lib, and Tim will, is one of the developers on that, and we'll kind of do a deeper dive on that. And then I wanted to highlight uh, this interagency LIDAR work group initiative that we've been working with um, uh, several agencies across the city um, to kind of drive forward um, more conversations on how the city should collaborate on these larger remote sensing data captures. So with our kind of transition um, into a new hosting environment, uh, what we've been working on the past year is really moving um, all of our core products to the cloud. Um, and what we're hoping this will achieve is you know, increasing scalability of the applications and data services. So um, all of our data products like GeoClient and the tiling services are not only available to agencies, but also to the public. So we want to be able to um, you know, anytime there's 
someone that wants to geocode, you know, thousands of records, that doesn't necessarily impact agencies that relied on that same service as part of their business operations. Uh, and with this move, we're also looking um, something that more reliable and faster services for end users. We're seeing um, a lot of agencies using those products as part of their core business operation, so we want to make sure that those are more reliable for our agencies. Um, for the productivity side for our group, um, this transition will also help simplify development workloads and, and deployment workloads and also could increase general productivity within our team um, for continuous integration and development. And I'll hand it over to Tim, he's one of the lead uh, developers of our um, NYC mapping library. And those links should work hopefully? Okay. Um, so some people, and I know uh, I know at least one person from Problem Health is going to uh, talk a little bit about one of the products that uh, was built with NYC Lib. But um, you know, I, I've spoken in front of a lot of you at OEM a few times uh, over the years, and not much lately. But last time, you know, expressed uh, some information about the platform that Eric talked about, which is a Kubernetes platform that we're moving to, but we're still kind of trying to wade our way through. Uh, um, you know, uh, the growing pains of moving to the cloud that everybody in the city's having. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so, you know, it's kind of been a tough run the last few years, but a few of the things that really have been highlights uh, for me at Do It the last few years were, you know, we all went through some civil service stuff that was hairy. Erica was almost canned because of it, but fortunately we kept her on board. She's now directing our group. Um, we, uh, and two of the other things that were really fantastic over the last couple of years were the work, was the work that I did with the NYC Lib in conjunction with uh, Chris Manitas. He's one of the other bright spots of the last few years. He's a fellow that we brought on from CUNY, and uh, he is now a permanent Do It employee. So he and I have been, um, we worked together on converting some old JavaScript libraries over to uh, node packages that can be easily incorporated into anybody's project if they're using uh, node in NPM. Um, and NPM. And really excitingly, one of the things that we did uh, that was very rewarding was we worked very closely with uh, Wally Sabri and the team he has at the MOPD to add in a number of uh, accessibility features into the framework so that um, our library is entirely um, navigatable uh, via a screen reader for blind people as well in terms of the applications that are produced. So, um, I'll just give you a quick look at what we have here. Uh, is there like a clock running that I need to know about? Yeah, Do I have a, oh, he has a sign for me? All right, great. <laughs> so, uh, what, what we do is, um, oh, it didn't, it didn't change. So, um, when we build our code, uh, and it's on GitHub, and we'll show you that there, um, but we, you know, version our release and release our code, uh, publish it to NPM, and uh, provide auto-generated documentation and examples with each release. So, yeah. So, you can see that, you know, when you look at documentation, you've got to, it explains how to use it. Look at the, pull down the modules. Um, you know, all of our modules are there. Just click any one. Um, click, click on the class. And so it'll get, you know, it's a basic API document that if you're a programmer, you, you understand, you're used to doing it, and, and when we write our code, we include document, uh, comments within the code that provide the auto generation of the documentation at build time to make it easier for developers to use. Um, we have an integration with GeoClients so that when you're using our libraries, you can automatically have a geocoder and enter uh, addresses or BBLs or bins or intersections or block faces um, very easily into it. And uh, um, so let's go back to the go back to the uh, documentation page. So uh, we'll click down into an examples. And so within the examples, there's also many examples of how to use each one of the classes within, or most of the classes within that library. Um, but let's just take a look at, uh, okay, so she's going to the example. 
Um, we incorporated uh, screen reader instructions provided by Huawei. Um, so go ahead and click return to the map. Um, somebody who wants to use their uh, MacBook or something can try this out because Mac has a screen reader built in or you can download JAWS or one of the other. Uh, there's a free one, I forget what it's called. Um, but so you can see she, uh, Eric has typed in the address, it did a call to GeoPine, it found the address, brings it back, sorts all of our locations by, uh, um, by distance from, from that place, and, uh, and all of this, do a right click uh, view source on the page. You'll have to do it on that, no, 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 do it on a, not a picture, do it on just an empty white space, yeah. So um, there's a little bit of CSS. Scroll past the CSS. Um, some basic configuration. This is all configuration. We're just instantiating an instance of Finder app. Scroll down, and that's it, right? And the rest of it is magic. So um, and we we can let's go back and let's just look at the less. Uh, do we have uh, the one that's fun? Is do the one with uh, Google Docs. This one. <laughs> Did you get the right one? It didn't look like the right one. Now go back. This one. <laughs> so this this is a, a, a little bit uh, lighter weight um, class to use, and if you don't like that whole wrapper or the finder app, um, you have all the same functionality, but you can add your own CSS or HTML around it so they can make it look like you want. This is obviously vanilla right now. But you saw all those dots coming in on the fly. Um, if you have, and, and it's coming from Google Docs, right? So you can just put some data up in Google, put it on your map. The reason why the dots come in one at a time in this one is because the data actually doesn't even have any coordinate information and we're geocoding it on the fly. You can put your in your Google Doc or your CSV file or whatever it is. Um, uh, addresses or addresses with coordinates and so on, and, and then the other fields of information, if structured according to the API, will provide you um, these uh, you know, list items with uh, additional information from the framework map. If you were to hit directions, go ahead and hit directions. Uh, we didn't actually do a search yet, but it's going to bring you out to Google, and it would give you the directions from the Finder app. It will do that embedded within the same site. So there's a, there's a lot of things you can do with it. We built the Hurricane Zone Finder with this, uh, uh, an application for Thrive NYC, for IBM NYC, I mean, the, the list goes on. We did something with Health of Pods, um, the uh, Pre K School Finder, and so on. All right, I'm going to hand it back over. Am I good? Do we cover what you wanted me to cover? Awesome. I just had. I just wanted to also quickly highlight the interagency LIDAR group. Uh, so this was initiated uh, last year following the 2017 LIDAR capture. And uh, we've been working with several agencies really helping define our future um, requirements for another LIDAR capture. And that work group and we're hoping similar work groups in the city will help us inform uh, what kind of data hosting and service needs um, that we can provide for other agencies. Uh, and so what that means is um, with our new platform and kind of that work group informing some of that direction, uh, we're going to be hopefully next year and beyond serving new web services for application developers or in the public in terms of web maps, tiling services, vector tiles, um, updated ortho imagery, um, and among other things. And I'll conclude. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I have now uh, Ben Mansell, um, the Buildings Department, Ben Mansell, and Kathy Simon, front end developer, and Feng Du Gao, we gotcha, from the Buildings Department, while I reset. And do you hand off the microphone?
I, I would just say that clearly we're plowing through this at a terrific rate, and there's no time for questions because we had so many agencies wanting to present. But this is like a first step, and we're hoping that this begins a dialogue so there will be a reach out to for questions that would be directed to the different presenters uh, following uh, this event. So that, that will be there. My name is Ben Mansell. I am uh, the GIS manager at Department of Buildings. Um, over the past few years, we've created several web applications, both internal and external. Um, some of these applications include the New York City uh, construction dashboard, the site safety locations map, and the recently released uh, after hours variance map. Today, we're going to um, present our newest work, the Community Profiles application. Um, we're a small group. Uh, we call ourselves the Dev Squad. Uh, it includes myself, Ben Gui, who uh, is our back-end developer and handles a lot of the data preparation. And we recently, re recently were able to hire a full-time front-end developer, Kathy Simon. So I will turn it over to Kathy. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathy Simon, and uh, I'm the Dev Squad. GIS, which I find extremely fascinating. Um, the Community Profiles app is um, a single page application that provides metrics at a glance. Um, we had about a month long discussion um, to um, determine which metrics would be good um, to show, and we decided on uh, permits, um, AHVs, which are after hours variances. Some of the tools we use, um, Java, JavaScript. Um, we're completely open source. We use uh, P3 and MVP3 for charting and data manipulation, visualization. Um, of course, jQuery and Bootstrap, which are really ubiquitous. Um, some of the challenges that we've faced, um, the multiple data sources um, coming from our um, new system and the old system, and I think we'll touch on that, um, and the development time frame. Um, we're also pretty agile. Um, we're able to get these apps out, usually every month or two. This one took us about three months with, the, with about a month of discussions, um, maybe two months of development and QA. Um, some of the challenges that we're facing also are making them accessible, so I'm excited to follow up with, with some of you here, and Tim, which I, I think he left, and you know, discuss some of the techniques that are using to make the apps more accessible. Um, one of the libraries that we use, the three, um, we're using them for their built-in functions. And in this case, the slide that you're looking at, um, we needed to be able to filter, um, assign colors to our maps, and outliers were causing um, problems. It didn't look good. Causing a problem, it didn't look good, and that's where custom code comes in. So I actually wrote um, some Java code that would um, calculate the percentiles and then color, um, fill in the map based on the percentiles. And we're on GitHub, so you'll be able to see all of our code as well, all of our apps. Um, we usually have a README file, um, and we're eager to reach out and, and learn and um, share what we know as well. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Ping now, who's our back-end developer. Hi, everyone. So I will be very briefly talk about the back-end and data engineering for this uh, application. So the goal for this uh, uh, backend data, uh, data engineering is trying to address two challenges. One is that we want this application to be real time, so that it uh, involves daily, at least the daily updates automatically. So we don't want uh, you know someone can uh, come to the work daily in the 4 a.m. to manually update the data. So another challenge is that. Uh, 
the data we realize that uh, it's really general, uh, generally used for many other things. So not only for this specific application, but uh, we have many other applications depends on the same sort of the, the same set of the data. So we uh, to address these two challenges, currently we have such set up such a solution. So we have added a middle layer of a data serving between our data warehouse and the uh, front end application. So this uh, middle layer uh, data serving is composed of two components. One is a data engineering, uh, data en uh, engine component, which composes of a database and some uh, uh, program to automatically grab the data from a, a data warehouse almost daily, automatically, and feeds to the data store in the middle layer. And then, uh, uh, and then there's uh, some data processing, like cleaning, calculations, and uh, storing the data host, uh, data store. And then we have another component, which called data serving component. So basically, we are using the uh, today most uh, trendy uh, RESTful web service to host the data to the public. So any other application can consume this uh, web service. And for this specific application, we use a helper task scheduler to consume the web service and, and uh, grab the data and the, uh, transfer the data to the GitHub, wherever currently the application is a host. Now I'm turning to the Ben to, ben, to demo the, the, our application. Thanks, Ben. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over the application that took me so long to get up. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is the application. There's uh, basically just six uh, buildings metrics um, that you can view. Each metric has a corresponding core plot map and associated uh, charts. Um, the map was built using d3.js and um, the community uh, district layer is a GeoJSON and uh, all the data is our JSON files. Um, the charts are uh, built using NVD3. Uh, so yeah, the first metric we have is um, active permits uh, for new buildings and major alterations. Um, the map tooltip uh, gives the total active permits and then breaks it down by NB and A1 or new building and major alterations. Um, this chart on the top left is the top 10 community districts for active NB and A1. Then we also have it for um, by borough. And uh, we have top 10 new building permits and also top 10 community districts for A1 permits. Uh, the next metric we have is active um, after hours variances. Um, this is broken down by reasons for the AHV, which is also displayed in the tooltip. Um, the user can click on and off which uh, reason that they want to see, any combination of those. And then um, we also have uh, the top 10 community districts for each reason um, at the bottom here. So, next we have active sidewalk sheds. Um, this is broken down by the type of sidewalk shed, so either construction or local law 11. We also have um, the average age of uh, per community district uh, for how long that sidewalk shed has been up and the total linear feet within that community district. Then we have complaints over the past year. Um, these are broken down by complaint types. Um, and they're also reflected in the tooltip and uh, complaint types by borough. Again, the user can choose which uh, complaints that they would like to look at. And then we have um, the top 10 community districts per complaint type here at the bottom. Um, next we have violations over the past year, and this is also broken down by violation type. And then finally we have construction related accidents over the past year, and uh, this is broken down by accident type. And we also have it um, the top 10 community districts in terms of injuries and fatalities. So that's basically it. Um, we hope to have this um, ready for the public in the near future. And uh, thanks for listening.
Department of Design and Construction is very happy to hear this because I know DDC and buildings need to talk to each other about sharing data, and I think you've got a partner now. So I'd like to introduce uh, Cherry Popolil, Director of CAD uh, for the Department of Design and Construction, to talk about CAD, GIS, and I guess also BIM uh, integrations. Let me just switch out. My nightmare scenario is that the links out would not work, but it should be working, so I'm a very happy guy. All Good afternoon, my name is Chayan Pupalil and I'm working for DDC and I'm the Chief of CAD for DDC. And what we are going to present here is the how we can collaborate GIS and CAD. <coughs> DDC is planning to be a friendly agency, so we are going to create an enterprise web portal and that can be accessible to all the DDC employees by and also by the outside utility companies, city agencies, and the co contractors and consultants. So this is a model we are developing now. And these are we are planning to bring all the data to one place so so everybody can see, you know, like outside people can see whatever we give permission to that, whatever they need. So and the one, the near me is one of the uh, one of the app which we are planning to put all the all the project data, all the uh, drawings, everything in that that one, so it can be accessible to uh, the utility companies, agencies, and other consultants. And the this is the GIS. We are planning to have creating a GIS portal. So, so that portal is integrated with Windows authentication and and features it features web mapping applications, project statistics, and geo newsletters. The three main applications in that portal are going to be DDC Active Projects. DDC infrastructure linking and DDC NEOME. So what what is called the DDC active projects? The active projects, so all the active projects in infrastructure and public buildings should will be there and link to all the other DDC applications. Example benchmark using the project ID parameters incorporated street. Smart and pictometry, street map, encyclopedia, and and the pictometry. And what the other one is the DDC infrastructure hyperlinking. So that we are going to have all the active and completed infrastructure projects in that area, and link to other maps useful to infrastructure designs, such as DDM maps, WPA maps, in INI maps. That's from uh, DEP and Sanborn Maps. And the DDC near me is uh, that's a collaborative tool with other utilities and other uh, capital construction agencies. So they can they can log into that one and get whatever they need. It provides situational awareness with the with the centralized access to capital construction projects can be accessed anywhere. So the, what we are planning to do in the future, so we are planning to do have a 3D underground infrastructure mapping and publishing Revit 
BIM projects to Geo Portal and mapping citywide 3D boring profiles and design and aspect drawings accessible to other agencies. And And we also planning to do a CAD GIS collaboration. So this is one of our typical CAD drawing. So it has all the BEP, water, sewer, all the all, utilities up there. And this is, uh, so we map the, uh, the sewer connections. That's, that's the data we're getting from BEP. And we are we connected to the GIS. And this is the water, we, that's also we, uh, we getting from the DEP, so we connected that to the GIS map. The, the, this is what we are planning to do, that we are going to have a 3D underground utilities. So we are planning to have the, the, the DEP, water, sewer, the corner is in, uh, what are the underground utilities we are planning to have in a 3D, uh, 3D mapping? So then, that that will be useful to all the our designers and other agencies. So this is what we are planning to do in the in the future. Thank you. Thank you for this. Meeting. I know Cherian and as care director, but also um, uh, Wei Ming Chen, who's a GIS director of DDC, are working together to really advance the data situation in underground infrastructure and in structures. And I know there's got to be 10 agencies that are interested in the progress that they'll be making. So this is a very exciting front in GIS because the underground has sort of been neglected because it's so hard to see. And, and I think that uh, DDC is now starting to turn X-ray eyes uh, beneath the uh, street level. Um, our next presenter is um, uh, Jin Wen, a, a Gizmo board member, uh, director of GIS for EDC. Uh, title of her presentation is Repurposed Data, Dark Data. I'd just like to mention that, you know, having such a great uh, GIS unit in EDC is also extremely important to the fact that EDC helps to manage a lot of startup businesses in the city, and with Jim there and her team there, it helps to promulgate uh, GIS tools and whatnot for startups to use. And I don't know, do we have any startup representative startup companies here in the audience? Raise your hand. We got a couple. Well, welcome, and uh, you know we're hoping that you can absorb some of this information and get in touch with Jim, and you know we can help power New York City's economic development engine with the city's data, with really bright, ambitious startup uh, companies that we're seeing more and more. Um, so now I'd like to move on to uh, uh, it's, it's education, actually. Or, that's that, that's all right. But it was good seeing you. <laughs> okay, so we have Peter, oh, not yet. Um, Peter Barker, uh, a, sustain, a sustainability specialist, DOE Office of Sustainability, will now present on GIS applications for sustainability. And I will Thank you. Switch. Yeah, I will just, uh, I'll give a brief introduction while the students are being made. I probably shouldn't stand up on the projector, huh? Um, so, hi, my name is Peter Barker. I work in the DOE Office of Sustainability. We are a pretty small office. Um, I can imagine most of you have not heard of us uh, before today. Um, there's about 18 or 19 of us at full strength. And I will make the full disclaimer here that none of us are data developers, uh, none of us are JS developers. Um, this is just something that we recognize its importance um, and we have started doing um, kind of in, with our supplemental time whenever we can find time. Um, so in many ways, I am grateful to all of you, all the work that you're doing in this room because of, oh, thank you because of the work that you're doing, you're making this possible, because we're really just a fledgling um, data slash GIS um, office now. Um, so we're, we're really trying to push the needle. Um, and we'll, I'll just go over a little bit what we've been working on and how we've been able to really benefit from 
uh, the work that all of you have been doing in New York City. So slightly different uh, lens than some of the other presenters today. And I will also make the disclaimer, I will not, there will be no sexy maps on the screen like everyone else has had. There will be no really cool charts, but I hope you are still interested in uh, learning about what we do. Um, so sustainability in New York City, we serve the entire uh, school system. So any school on any given day we could be working with. Um, there's over 1,800 schools, 130 million square feet of space within those buildings, um, serve over a million meals, second only to, second uh, most in the country, second only to the United States Army. Um, a lot of students, a lot of meals. Um, so we can have a really big impact in, in our office. Uh, so we primarily work on outreach. We work my my job on a day to day basis to do work outreach and work directly with the stakeholders in schools. Uh, but we we realize the, the importance of working um, with GS and with data and how it's been helpful for us um, even as a fledging program. Um, we work. We have folks in the, on the office that work on putting solar panels on schools. That work on demand response, which is resiliency uh, for the for the energy grid. Uh, we work on recycling, we work on organic waste expansion throughout schools, really. Uh, we, we do trainings for, we say we will work with anyone in the building that will talk to us. Anyone that's related to a school, school-based staff, we work with them. Uh, we're pulling data from all over the place. We're pulling data from some of you in this room. Uh, we are, we're taking surveys of teachers, we're pulling um, stuff that's publicly available from the city, and we're really just aggregating and getting that into an application so that we can get that out to schools, to our partners, to the organizations that we're working with on, on, a, on a daily basis so that they can provide better services to schools. So again, I'm going to keep saying thank you, but I appreciate the work that everyone here does to really push the needle in New York City. Um, so here it is, the, first, the most boring map you'll probably see on the screen today. Uh, but I think it, it's really important because it shows the breadth of the work in New York City. So our outreach team on any given day could be at any one of these buildings. This is representative of every DOE building in New York City. You'd be hard pressed to stand on a street corner and not see a school down the block. There are schools everywhere. You might not realize it if you don't uh, work in this, in this world. Uh, but there are schools everywhere, and it's, it's really important for, for us because each of these individual points has over 50 data points just from our office that we have in the last a year, I would say, that we have attached to these points that our team can look up. They can, they can see who the, the point of contact is in the school. Um, they can see what the enrollment is. They can see if they attend one of our trainings um, in the last few years. There's a lot of individual data that we're able to aggregate and put on GIS for our teams to work um, on the go, in the field, um, in the office. And I'll, as I said before, most of the folks in our office, I would say almost all of the folks in our office and the, the folks we work with, do not identify as data people. Um, I, I am certainly an aspiring data person and working on, uh, working on this and some of the other data projects in our office. Um, but this has to be accessible, um, user-friendly, and intuitive for the folks who, who, need to, who need to work with this data to give vital feedback so that we can inform our stakeholders and work with our stakeholders um, appropriately and get the resources we need to school. So that is why this has been, this has been crucial because they're able to visualize and utilize this data. Um, and I'll have a couple examples of it. Um, so in addition to, so I, I should have given a, a pretext this, we, we use two apps in our office. One um, is primarily for logistics internal for uh, the division of school facilities which we operate under. Um, so we have lots of logistics pieces that aren't really relevant to people outside of our, our microcosm. But we also have an external partner facing app which is available to anyone that works in, in sustainability within the school system. So a lot of our nonprofits that are providing services directly to schools, they'll say like, I, I need to know this, this uh, facet about a school. I want to know who the point of contact is for all these schools in this region of the city so that I can offer my services to them because I have a grant to give money to those schools. So we, we created this app which has information tailored to our partners uh, so that they can then access it and get the information they need to in, in turn give the services, uh, provide services to schools, um, and it's accessible to everyone uh, and anywhere. Uh, and we have now made it so that they can, they will download the data directly from us because we were having this issue in our office that we we had data we needed to get to people so we said okay here's our app go in there and download the data on this on the subset of schools that you want that you want information from so now they can get all the principals all the sustainability coordinator contact for information they can know the enrollment they can know if it's a high school or or x x whatever data about that specific school um, so that they can provide their services and we can we can better address the uh, the sustainability issues and, and push the needle. 
Um, so in, in addition to getting, just getting data out to our partners, um, we also, we use this to better facilitate our facilities operations as well. So for those of you who are not familiar with Demand Response, it's a big, it's a big program in New York City where uh, buildings agree to reduce their load during high stress time. So when all of you are pumping your air conditioning over the summertime, um, the city might, is in danger of a brownout or a blackout, right? Uh, so what happens is the city and the grid operators, they say we need to reduce energy right now or there's a chance of a brownout or a blackout. So these individual schools uh, were called uh, uh, a high number of times. So these are all the schools that are in our demand response program. So over the summertime, those schools with the red dots, those are the schools that shut down and prevent, prevent blackouts in New York City because they are giant buildings that will shut down much of their operations um, and other city organizations um, and large entities do this. Um, but this helps us to better work on our facilities and our outreach. Um, so we can work with these schools and say, how can, we, how can we find more energy for you to conserve during these high, these high stress, high peak times um, so that we can make the city more resilient? Um, and, like, and as I was mentioning, um, many of the folks in our office don't identify as data people. I was sitting down with one, our communications coordinator last week, and she said, we have this event at Teachers College, which is the, the gold star on the map. She said, we, we need to get this out to, to people in the area. We, we, we want to blast out to schools around there. So I, I was able to just bring up this application and say, hey, these are the school districts. These are the schools that are located in the area. And she can literally point, point to the screen and say, OK, this is, this is where this, these are the schools that I want to invite. We can send it to her. And it, it's a, a improving our outreach. In the same vein, the, the, the DEP was able to uh, provide a stormwater management grant just because they were able to go into our application and find schools that they downloaded from the, the screenshot that I showed you before. Uh, they found schools that were in the targeted region for stormwater management. They pulled the data, they were able to reach out to those schools, those schools got resources. We're then addressing the systemic sustainability issues or, or getting to the root uh, of providing resources to address those issues um, in New York City, which has been really useful for us. Um, so I'll kind of finish off here with oh, what we've been doing recently uh, as, a, as a fledgling uh, GIS team, or, or aspiring GIS team. Uh, so this is all of our partner outreach from the previous year. Uh, so our partners report back to us and they say, uh, these are the schools we worked with, um, so nonprofits, other city agencies, any service provider to schools um, in the sustainability realm. And they say, uh, we work with these schools and then we report back and we send them data and we give them, give them a map of where they've worked. Uh, but we saw there are gaps, thank you. Um, there are gaps in our outreach. So right up here in East, East Harlem, Upper East Side, there's a gap. All those red dots, those are schools that had no, no one had been working with. Um, so we naturally thought, well, have we worked with them as well? Because we need, to, we need to reach out to these schools. Why haven't they been talking to us? A lot of these schools are high on the economic need index, with the, which the DOE publishes each year. So we need to be addressing the inequity within our own system. Um, and this is how we're beginning to do it. So we we removed all the schools that we have worked with in that area in addition to our partners, and we isolated these five schools, which we then blasted, um, we did a targeted outreach to, to make sure that they got resources at the start of this school year, to, that they had the opportunity to engage if they wanted to. Um, and it's really improving our, our efforts um, to address inequity and make sure that schools are, are engaged and just work, improving our outreach in general. Uh, so of course, we're still trying to push, push forward um, and, and we want to provide uh, an application that is for schools that they can, they can interact with solely on sustainability um, related things, whether it's um, uh, impending climate impacts or resiliency or different energy, energy efficiency operations, which could be more useful for us. Is there a boiler upgrade um, within a school? We need to know about it. It helps our, our facilities team, um, but we are continuing to, to, to push forward and I will finish up by saying thank you to all of you because you are making the work that we do possible. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, you may be at the beginning of your GIS journey, but uh, you're already showing some very impressive results. It's good to see you bringing in data from other agencies and sharing with other agencies as well. And, you know, it, I can't help but think, wouldn't it be great if we had a comprehensive list of all the applications that are being created by New York City agencies and also all the data that they use and all the data that they create? It would be a huge resource for 
more beginning agencies like buildings and, and well, everyone, even mature ones, to understand the complete realm of GIS resources. So anyway, so much for the editorial. Uh, bring on <laughs> Deborah, Professor Laffer from NYU, who again we thank for making this one facility available. I will get your presentation out. So I'm Deborah Lather, and I serve a couple of roles here at NYU of faculty, both in our Center for Urban Science and Progress, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, as well as faculty in civil engineering. Uh, I also wear the extra hat of Director of Citizen Science. So I'm going to talk just a hair about our program, what we're doing, how you all might want to get involved with your data. Um, and then a little bit of work that my group in particular is working on and how it kind of keys into some of the LIDAR initiatives here in the city. Uh, so CUSP is the Center for Urban Science and Progress. We basically think of ourselves as big data for big cities. Um, it's a 11-month master program, two semesters and a summer. It's really a truly interdisciplinary master's degree. About 60% of our students come from some technical background. They were from computer science, architecture, civil engineering, and the other 40% come from economics, education, uh, social sciences, and everybody's there. Some come in with a lot of program experience, some come in with none. Um, and we have a boot camp for those who come in without any, but the idea is that if you are interested in doing a lot of the things that we've been seeing today in terms of really enabling data, this would be a program that you might consider. It can be done part-time or full-time. And what I think of particular interest is our capstone. Um, and this is something where we go out and we get an external sponsor, which might be your city agency or your company uh, or the city of Phoenix. Uh, or a startup organization, and we pair them with an internal mentor, and then there's about four to five students that then work on this problem, typically related to the acquisition, cleaning, and integration, and then enablement of data. Um, so they'll work through the spring, and then full, they'll work part-time in the spring, and full-time through the summer on that. This year's deadline for submission of projects, and you really only need 100 or two words, is November the 27th. So if you're still interested in doing this, you can either contact myself, Deborah Lafer, here at this address, or I'm around afterwards. Uh, or if you're with the city agency, you can go through Terry Matthews at Town & Gown. A um, couple other programs that we get involved with, some uh, events that we regularly have, kind of big conferences and workshops like this relating to urban issues. We held a Cavalry Symposium uh, about a year and a half ago on Sensing in the City and one on Sustainable Undergrounds uh, sponsored by NSF this past summer. We have an event that's coming up that may also be of interest, uh, this being with Town & Gown, January 29th with Terry Matthews under the roadway. It's a half-day event. It's going to be held in uh, Lower Manhattan. So, uh, we'll talk about data. Talk a lot about data. Talk a lot about maps. Underlying getting good data and good spatial data and trying to really start to understand how cities work above ground below ground in 3D is how to capture that. Um, so I want to just introduce a little bit of work that we've been doing in this area. Uh, it's a new spatial database, Ariadne 3D. Because when we talk about this LiDAR data, the, it's becoming readily available. USGS has now flown about 60% of the country and made available 18 trillion points, laser points. Um, New York City is now, as Erica mentioned, uh, has been collecting data, is now thinking about actually possibly doing an annual LiDAR collection. So what does this look like? I mean, we're talking millions, billions, and ultimately trillions of data points. The storage is not the problem, and what you're going to see here is some real I can get it to work, hello, state-of-the-art data. So this would be typical, good quality, commercial grade LiDAR, uh, 35 to 50 points per square meter. You can see some stuff, but not that much. And yet, what we, with the same equipment, same flight height, the helicopter, we can get this. 
this data is good enough, obviously, for the utility lines. We could pull out the curb height. Uh, we, our group, is going to be releasing the first section of this kind of data for one square kilometer in Sunset Park, hopefully before the end of the, uh, the calendar year. Uh, and it will be even denser than this, and it will be available along with um, imagery. Uh, so, storing all this data in terms of, no, we don't want to do that. There we go. What do you do with all this data? So, what you saw was some work that I did from my previous institution in Dublin, Ireland, and we wanted to understand, you know, what do you do with this data? What can we do with this data that we couldn't do before? So, we said, okay, well, what if we did a solar study? Um, and so, this is, sorry, this is the Brooklyn. Um, Army terminal, and this is the data, this is a preview of the data area that we're going to be releasing. Um, but we started saying, you know, what can you start doing with it? And the challenge then becomes not putting it somewhere, we're all good at collecting and putting the data, but how do you access it? How do you share it? And so we started to develop something further upstream in terms of a new spatial database that works in distributed computing. And there's obviously a lot of challenges with this because you've got obviously the data volume and it's now being collected faster and more than ever before, but you're collecting it with other kinds of data, with imagery, maybe with hyperspectral imagery, maybe with near infrared, maybe with thermal, um, electromagnetic data. And as our sensors get cheaper, we'll be collecting more environmental data, things about pollutants in the air. And so we have to start thinking about all these different data formats. Some things we're going to be collecting every day. Some things we're going to be collecting once a week. Do you report the peak? Do you report every single data point? Do you report the average? What does this mean? If you have a sensor here and one over there, but this other one is covering everything, how do you deal with the upscaling, downscaling um, issues related to that? Um, so our current solution, um, <coughs> uses uh, Exceed, this is an NSF grant for getting people who are non-computer scientists into distributed computing. Um, and here's a quick preview. It's always the danger of embedding your videos. There you go. Um, the idea is you can go in and search for wherever you want it. This is our coverage area in Dublin. Um, so you can see look, all the blue stuffs, the LIDAR, all those little yellow things were cranes moving under different uh, times that we took the, the scan. But what's, I think, interesting is here, along the bottom, what you're seeing is actually the full waveform version of the data, which is something that's not otherwise available. And it gives us more information, maybe potentially about the materials, about conditions of things, and we can then use this to actually, this tool to determine, you know, that's the helicopter, and you can see in that scan line the actual points where they're being scanned in here. So there's a lot of metadata and other kind of hidden data that's available to us in these scans that we've not been using very well. So the idea was to develop uh, this interface with the distributed back end to start exploiting some of that. Um, a lot of it works on trying to understand what's the best data index, um, and there's not much guidance in this, so, so. Um, the idea is that this tool will be eventually available to actually test different indices on data storage. Where we've used it to date is for sold. So this is an example where we took all 1.4 billion points over a one and a half square kilometer area, and we did a solar analysis. I'm obviously not too adept at this. Now I might need your help. There's just to be an embedded video here. There it is. All right. Um, and. For each point in here, we did a solar analysis for an average of 12 hours a day, uh, every 30 minutes. 
And so what you're looking at is about, I think, 13 trillion calculations. And this is the accumulated solar potential. So when we talk about the DOE and sustainability, could we put embedded PV into some of those windows, into some of those walls, these kind of things in critical areas? So an analysis like this would tell you that areas were red or hot areas, areas that get a lot of sun exposure, which would be pretty good, and areas that are blue or dark are obviously ones that are pretty low potential for this. And what's interesting, though, I think what we've done with this is we've then stored all of these results back with the original points. So why would you want to do this? Well, this goes back to Jim's point about data reuse. And where did we decide to reuse this data? We decided to do a shadow analysis. So this is the same data set, a little different area of it. And what you're seeing is the sun coming across the city over a single day in November. And what you'll notice is that in some of the very narrow streets, they're not getting very much sun, even at the height of daylight. So when we talk about understanding planning, understanding the impact of putting on higher buildings, uh, trying to maximize you know, the square footage on buildings and setbacks and issues like this, tools like this can be very useful. And again, what this was is that is that it was actually a pre-step in the solar analysis. But we were able to do it because we had a good way of reusing that data, that we were able to store it in a way uh, that was accessible. So I'm excited to be part of this, and I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. I know we have a class at 4 o'clock right after this, so we're, we will get kicked out. But we can use the area of the lobby outside if people want to network and stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor. And I'd like to call up now um, uh, Yuri Higuchi from Emergency Management to speak about automating field data management each season 2019. Howdy, uh, first time we're meeting. Um, I'd just like to point out the fact that what Professor Laffer was talking about was, was really what the future of data is in smart cities, which is the use of sensors, all kinds of sensors, aerial sensors and probes underground and Internet of Things sensors, um, RFID on infrastructure. And we know that if it's a sensor, it's GIS, and it mingles with all the other GIS information that we are all uh, creating. So that really the future, the future of data is the future of GIS, is the future of sensors. And thank you, uh, Deborah, for helping to pioneer this. Um, so now, Office of Emergency Management, I have to... Okay. Hi, my name is Yuri Higuchi. I'm a Jazz Specialist um, at New York City Emergency Management. Today I want to talk about one way uh, we provide a more efficient workflow for field data collection using different apps. Um, I'm specifically going to talk about our past heat season and we're working on building similar processes uh, for other incidents. So just a little bit about uh, New York City Emergency Management GIS. Uh, we are a team of 11. Uh, we provide data mapping support in um, our agency and from writing plans to participating in activations. So maps, dashboards, online applications, data support, etc. <coughs> One way we support decision making is through our heat season. Um, our heat season is from June through September. Uh, during this time, we open up our heat emergency plan, which uh, consists of opening up 500 cooling centers. These cooling centers are uh, rec centers, senior centers, libraries, anywhere for the public to come in and uh, cool off. Um, the public would be able to see which centers are available on our website. And throughout this time, we have three key players. Uh, human Services, the team that reaches out to, to our partner agencies, um, who are the ones opening up these cooling centers, and GIS. 
Cooling center statuses change due to broken ACs or building issues, and so GIS's main goal is to provide live information open to the public. So in order to do that, um, we had a workflow um, which starts off with our agency point of contact sending emails to human services who then sends an email to GIS and GIS manually updates these changes on our database. We then export it out to a CSV and um, upload it in our cooling center finder webpage. And then throughout, this, throughout the day when we are activated, uh, we send out email summaries of open and closed cooling centers throughout the agency. This process itself would take about 20 to 30 minutes at, um, every single time there's a change. And so a lot of the challenges that we faced were that email chains would get lost or we would have duplicates coming in at once. Um, the updates would take it too long and the changes would sometimes be at odd hours. And then the changes happen so frequently that the summary emails would be outdated. Um, finally, our, uh, it would be difficult to do this at the same time as other emergencies happening uh, at the same time, such as our steep pipe explosion in July 2018. So we realized we needed a change. Um, during, we first started off with a pre-season application. Uh, this is on Fulcrum. Uh, Fulcrum is a survey application that also provides spatial information. Uh, we used this in the past and it went well, well with our process, so we started off with this. Um, and so we upload, uploaded last year's list of cooling centers so that the partner agencies can review the information before the season started. Um, and then we downloaded that data and set up in our GIS database. So when uh, we expected a heat wave, he, uh, human services contacted the agencies to use our activation application for any status changes to their cooling centers. So the changes would happen be right before and during our activations. So these changes would include special hour, short term, long term closures. And this is what it would, they would um, fill out, an example of what they would fill out. So once these changes happen, um, uh, we have a Python script that checks um, for updates every five minutes. If there is an update, um, that change gets pulled into um, our GIS database. It joins into our database and um, updates there, and then it uh, exports a CSV and pushes out to our cooling center finder. There's two other parts to this workflow that I'll explain later. Um, so once uh, the, the script runs and runs successfully, we receive an email um, for the GIS team that says that it ran successfully, yay. Um, and then we have our cooling center finder, which would show all the open uh, cooling centers and the wheelchair accessible ones. Human services would also take this time to make sure that it would, um, all of the centers are visible. And in response to this new process, we realized we needed a more timely summary email. So instead of an email, we switched to an ArcGIS online dashboard for internal use. Um, this is automatically updated from our GIS database. So we, we don't uh, touch this and just open it for our, um, for our agency. Finally, we have a beta version of um, uh, ArcGIS Collector and Workforce application. Uh, for during these activations, sometimes our responders go to spot check some of these centers for any AC issues, um, signage, um, etc. And so they, what they did, they used to use um, like paper forms and uh, take pictures of these photos and send it to our human services. But uh, this year, we try to use um, this application to. Uh, for them to fill out during the site visits. Um, so this is a new process and we learned a lot this heat season. Um, first of all, we learned that 
the fulcrum licenses can be an issue. Um, there might not be, we encounter not enough licenses for the, for the heat season, and sometimes the same people are not the, the, the partner agency point of contacts are not always the same during every activation. Um, we also had a system based on our current, uh, on certain parameters. So the preseason, we gave agencies oppor opportunity to add new or remove these centers, but um, during the application uh, activations itself, these were set, set data points. So we had data challenges that we needed to adjust on the fly during the activations, especially during holidays or weekends. Uh, finally, we had more specific data questions. Uh, while all of this process was run increased successfully, um, these questions were not asked previously, and so a lot of these questions were future and historical data, which the system was not uh, meant for. It was to provide live updates, and so uh, we had to adjust by providing um, different an analytical tools, such as a Tableau dashboard. So um, we are excited to uh, continue building upon this new process and first we want to refine our backend process. We want to work with Do It to improve the accessibility on the finder and uh, finally we want to use more analytical and field uh, collection tools uh, such as putting the collector application into production. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can email me. Ever since forming the Emergency Mapping and Data Center uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, OEM has just gone from strength to strength. I think now they have a repository of a thousand data layers that they use to help protect uh, New Yorkers from disasters and emergencies. Um, um, my next speaker is a uh, friend and uh, a colleague from the Department of Finance, Amanda Cruz, uh, from the Tax Map Unit. She will talk about property valuation and mapping. And, you know, Deborah's presentation about uh, LIDAR is something that um, Amanda has already put into action and uh, has created enormous value. So take this. I'll switch now. specifically the tax map um, Oops. Sorry. Can I go back? Okay, the tax map unit is in charge of the digital tax map of the city of New York. And that is a comprehensive inventory of all the parcels of the city of New York. And its importance is because it's the basis for property valuation. Um, let me go back. When I became the director, I realized, when I became the director, I uh, um, realized that our applications were uh, aging. So I assess both of our applications. We have an internal application that is used for the maintenance by the cartographers in the office and a public facing application, WebGIS, for the distribution of the information for the public. Um, that's when I decided to embark on a project and in addition to upgrading the applications, think about new functionality. So I decided to look into 3D. And why? Because in the tax map, we also have condo uh, units. And right now, all you can see is that letter C, an annotation with the condo number. So I envision our map to be a 3D cadastral map in the future. So we want to visualize lots already that are in our tax map, air and subterranean, also integrate 
condominium floor plan <coughs> into GIS also have the opportunity to potentially create an actual 3D lot. And by that I mean is that the real estate industry is changing very quickly. And we have got a request to actually create a lot over a lot that is not a condominium. And we can do that right now. Um, also, the current technology coexists with 2D. So we can have both the land parcels as well as the 3D layers. And why? Because we also want to do further modeling and analysis. Let me see if this all goes. Oops. Okay. So this is what we envision in the future, to be able to see the stack of the actual condominium, but also the actual footprint inside of the uh, building, so we can see all the different units. And this will also help in the operations. By that I mean that currently we have to review all the floor plans that are printed. This way we can integrate 3D and then be able to manipulate that object. And again, additional benefits would be to create additional models so we can determine valuation according to perhaps uh, the height or, or where your condo unit is located. And also, like um, it was mentioned before, uh, light and shadow analysis. When I joined uh, DOF, there was very little, you know, GIS applications. It was basically the tax map that was publicly available. So we decided to create more products for the public, and this is one. So now here we're joining the assessment data in with the tax map and serving that to the public by borrow. There's another web GIS application that was developed for uh, comparable sales tools because we have, again, a lot of data but it was never really mapped before. And lastly, the agency decided to uh, invest in Cyclomedia. And now, as you can see, there are multiple dots, various colors of blue. That, those are different years that the data has been captured. And now there's another unit within the department that is taking all this information for um, assessment review. Instead of sending immediately all the staff to the field, they can also do reviews of properties on their desk. And also take the information that is behind all these photos, which is lighter, and do further analysis. So now that's being... Um, underway. And if you have any questions, you can talk to me after. <laughs> Amanda, can I just ask you one question, which is, can you give some kind of a scale in terms of the kind of benefits you're realizing from your various mapping innovations? Uh, translates into revenue for the city of New York. And so the more accurate information that we can capture, the more assistance that we can tap into and bring into a GIS has enabled us to generate more revenue. That will benefit everybody in the city. Can, can we say that's in the tens of millions of dollars? Just justify the entire investment in GIS for the last 25 years. Thank you. Now it's my privilege to uh, bring up the fire department, Michael Brady, who's the GIS director, and Matt Adams, the GIS specialist, to talk about GIS support for FDNY operations. Um, How's everybody doing? We're getting late in the afternoon, so see everybody's getting a little tired. I'll try and wake you up a little. We're going to move pretty quick through a lot of slides. I'm going to go over some operational uh, perspective of GIS from, for the fire department. And then Matt's going to talk a little bit about the statistical and analy analytic side. OK, so 
little bit about who we are. Uh, we're about 12,000 firefighters and officers, 4,300 on the EMS side. Last year combined, we did over 1.75 million runs. So we're pretty busy as an agency. Next. Uh, a lot of the agencies that we collaborate are you guys. So something I would have incorporated but I forgot about was this past summer with the cooling centers, we were able to ingest or consume that rest end service from OEM for the cooling centers into a map of where our cooling uh, incident locations were for EMS and then populate an operations dashboard. It was really the first time to see dynamic data from another agency, so it was a good success. Um, so as an agency, emergency uh, response agency, we're always looking and talking about preparation and this cycle of preparation or what's preparedness. So we can come up with a plan, we train, we exercise, and then we evaluate it and do it all over again. So our stakeholders are actually buying into now. GIS is more than just paper maps, a web map. It's a way to take data and look at it. And if it could be mapped, visualized, and analyzed, they can use it to make better decisions in the field. So that's kind of where we're headed. So the, the best thing that we did over the last few years was this transition from data sets to data services and getting portals stood up and taking these feature services and pushing them out. So again, going back to that collaboration with OEM, we were able to share with them dynamically where the incidents were happening, uh, heat incidents related to cooling centers and that spatial relationship. Are there cooling centers open where we need them to be open? We need to ask them to open some more. Um, and the ability to do that on the fly, where in the past we would have to ask them, send us a file, we would download it, upload it, it was painful. So going forward, it's just getting a lot better with streamlining that data, that process. So that led to our uh, integration into our web map application called CRIMS, Critical Response Information Management System. It's an internal web map that we started producing with these services, and again, of an, uh, the ability to display where things were happening in the city so that we have at a glance situational awareness and again share this out with agencies for a common operating picture. So some of the information in the map, building information, most of our incidents happen at a building footprint. We want to know everything we can about that building from the footprint. Whether it's internal information, uh, the SIDS information, it's um, floor plans, building information cards, it's links to DOB. We want to locate all that information at the building footprint. Subway plans, the same thing. The ability to visualize that subway footprint that's below grade for an incident commander to see how far that stretches, where entrances are, exits, emergency exits, and again, floor plans that OEM work with to digitize. We have the ability to pull them up in the map tabular data or text data about where these, uh, the emergency exits are, the toll booth, the token booth, I should say, the phone number for there, the station numbers before and after, track designations, third row power, all that is an attachment on that station point. CCT cameras, CCTV cameras, we've located DOT, some private cameras. In the map, we might get lucky to locate a camera that's near an incident, and we could pull that up in a viewer and just get some situational awareness about that. Uh, some of the widgets that we incorporated, the Pentometry Online widget, it's a nice tool for our incident commanders or our FDOC to look at. We can see the four sides of a building, which we call exposures. You can measure. It gives us a little bit of a view about an incident when we're responding there so we get a better size up on the way or attain some more information instead of just waiting for units to report back from the scene. Again, I have to applaud Amanda. We're benefiting from her contract with Cyclomedia. We're getting current high resolution street view imagery. That gives us, again, the ability to look at a building, size it up, get a visual about it as we're responding. Units can look at this on an iPad in the car, Chief can, and now they have a, a visual of the building there as they're listening to the radio. We can use this for pre-planning of incidents um, and the ability to look at the high resolution. I've actually been able to zoom in on a telephone pole or a utility pole and see the ID tag. 
So again, taking that those data streams and trying to apply some more analytics to it. We've been utilizing operations dashboard a lot more, putting some graphs in. This is for our EMS response times, and we're looking at you know the trends for them for our critical uh, segments, one to threes, and then four to eights, where they're happening in the city and the geographic response areas. And EMS makes the decisions on that and moves uh, units around accordingly. So that led us to trying to get that internal map to the outside, which a lot of agencies here will admit is very difficult because of firewall rules, technology. So we actually procured a, a cloud server. We have an Amazon EC2 instance that we push data out from there. We utilize the uh, Esri Explorer app, a collector app, app to display and collect data. And we push the same services that we have internally to iPads and mobile devices out in the field for units to see and use at the scene. Our incident management team has been very successful with Collector and Survey123, using that both for building damage assessment and for surveys with post-emergency canvassing operations and the ability to display that in operations dashboard. Uh, decision makers like to see that, you know, that transformation of data to the analytics side. So what we're really excited about now, since we were kind of one of the first agencies to get drones up in the air, and we were utilizing primarily for situational awareness and streaming video back, now we're trying to convince the stakeholders in the agency we can do more with it and create 2D and 3D map products. So next slide. We, we partnered with DOB for building damage assessment for some time now. So we flew a drone mission out at Fort Totten. We partnered with Esri and Packet Hagen actually put together this 3D scene, which is pretty cool. And it's just kind of showing you how the mission was flown with the drone. And then we processed the imagery through drone to map and came up with some 3D products for the building analysis and seeing the damage to the buildings. So we're excited about exploring this more for ongoing incidents when we have an incident like a gas explosion or some type of an incident where we're going to be operating out for some time. Which leads me to Matt. He's going to talk a little more about the analysis side. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to pause just for a second to give you a sense of how the GIS unit fits in the FDM line, because I think it's an important lesson. Uh, we basically are one of four different teams. Operations research works on process improvement. We have a data quality team that focuses on the MMR, very long-term strategic planning. But the real key here is the data quality team. They understand data from various data sources, how you can use it, how you can't use it. And that's a really a, a big help, so everybody doesn't have to have that knowledge. Um, and another really great benefit is, even though we only have four teams, we all come from different backgrounds. Uh, and so that's, that's just, it's great to have people from different perspectives um, and, and challenging you in different ways. So by far the most basic and frequent request we get is to look at incidents over space and time. The map to the left is uh, a density of, of runs to structural fires uh, using a kernel density function. Uh, the map to the left, is, uh, sorry, right, is average travel time to those same incidents. You can see that it's about the same citywide, so that's good news for all of you. There's no geographic bias based on where you live. You're, you're not at a disadvantage to responding to a structural fire. So we do tons of maps for fire, you know, uh, where are gas leaks, water leaks, where are incidents of high-rise buildings, but we do way more for EMS. And this is just a quick, uh, quick example in the, in the interest of time. We had opiate overdoses, gunshots, and stabbing incidents in the Bronx. And you can see that the epicenter in red shifts around the South Bronx. Uh, on the incident. So, uh, this all end with the slide then. Uh, so, GIS data, we, we incorporate it in literally every model, every project that we do. It might not always contain a geographic, you know, statistical technique or um, uh, process, but as an example of this, we recently upgraded our risk based 
uh, inspection system model. So we don't have the resources to inspect all buildings citywide. We need to prioritize the ones that are the most at risk. So we took the classic definition of risk, the probability of a fire occurring, a really serious fire occurring. Then if that happens, what's the consequence? Uh, what's the consequence? Is a civilian going to be hurt, possibly die as a result of that fire? And then if buildings are given an equal weight, we'd rather visit the building that has people sleeping in them than that does not. So it's just a really simple model uh, that ingests a ton of GIS data. Um, you know, data from Map Pluto, uh, data from, uh, let me go back, I'll, I'll end that uh, And then, you know, 311, uh, police, police crime data, uh, our own incident, incident data. Um, so, we do a lot of other stuff, but let's quick overview in three quick slides. Thanks. see the direct line between the old uh, Phoenix unit and the fire department that responded to 9-11 and this sophisticated, extraordinary effort that the fire department is now putting out uh, at, at this point, protecting us all. Um, I'd like to call up the uh, health department presenters, um, uh, Mustafa Ali, um, a city research scientist, Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response. Um, I just say that my first uh, encounter with health was during the West Nile virus crisis uh, around 1999-2000 when health department along with Hunter College actually developed algorithms that predicted where West Nile was going to turn out and actually stop the disease cold using GIS. So I'm sure you can send this with advances. It, it won't be as interesting. <laughs> Okay, so I'm Mustafa Ali, I work at the Department of Health. I go by Moose since I work in emergency, it's always better to limit the syllables that you speak in a sentence so you can get your point across. Moose. So, it's on the, it's on the slide too, that's great. How do you change slides? Cool, so we're going to talk about GIS approaches to emergency field response specifically the points of dispensing program. Okay. Oh, I made a slide for that. So we're going to talk about the pod assignment, specifically the GIS portion, the reporting aspect, and the public sharing aspect of it as well. Okay, just a little bit of background. Pods, they are located strategically. We'll talk more about that in all five boroughs. There's 165 active ones. And they serve the public during health emergencies. The usual use case is prophylaxis. So think something like a biological attack, and we have to provide meds to the members of the public as soon as possible. So these facilities are cited based off population density to best serve the public as quickly as possible. And DOH and HSAP, along with volunteers from organizations such as Red Cross, Medical Reserve Corps, other human services organizations are part of this. Okay, so how do we assign people? Well, we geocode them. You notice the distribution of pods is not evenly distributed. You know, it's based on population density, so places with higher density have more pods located. But DOH employees and volunteers, they don't all live in specific places, right? So what do we do with them? Now that we map them, how do we actually assign them more efficiently or more based off the need at each pod? Well, we use GIS. Essentially, we created a Python script that utilizes the Esri network analyst you know, function to assign staff based off two criteria. Not criteria, but two processes. Location allocation and closest facility. Location allocation essentially decides that these facilities matter more than where the people actually live, and we assign that based off the need at the facility. So if you look at the Rockaways area, you'll notice some people that are close to this pod still being assigned to Brooklyn. Why? Because that pod in Brooklyn requires, you know, specific staff that have these specific, you know, so we're specialties and whatnot, skills that are needed to operate that pod. And you also notice that we put New York State as assigned first because we do have staff in other parts, 
like New Jersey, and then we assign them after that. So out of New York State, they're only assigned via closest facility. Notice that they're only going to specific areas because those are the only outlets to get into New York City, pretty much, from Jersey. Okay, so let's go a little bit over workflows. So you can see what you saw in the previous slide. That's pretty much what we do. We use ArcGIS inside of a geo database that then gets published to our staffing database that's hosted on SQL Server. In the case of an extreme emergency, we're actually able to leverage it using ODBC, which is Object Database Connections, to actually send dynamic messages to whoever's in that database, depending on which pods are being opened. Because pods aren't always open all at once. In fact, has anyone ever witnessed a pod being open? No? I mean, we did one for flu, so that was one few years. But it's okay. Great. <laughs> it's fine. You never actually want to have this happen. Okay, so what happens next? <laughs> It's one of those things you want to prepare for that never will happen, you know, but it can. So anyway, once we do the GIS process, this is where our internal processes with IT and other infrastructure come in. The automated flow sends it to the major database, the DOHMH one, which also hosts our volunteers as well. We store them all in one place, and that's from there where every single member of the agency gets a message that this is your pod site, and you may be given at any notice the we don't command to show up to that pod to start setting it up and start serving the public soon after. So from there we do two things. One, an automated flow to our special emergency notification systems. One is called Vesta, the other is called GAL. That's not really important. One is static messaging, the other is dynamic messaging. And we also load the information into NICAP. So Fendi mentioned post-emergency canvassing. We have PICO volunteers, that's a separate program. And those staff are also in NICAP. So anyone who's a city employee can actually see their assignment, their role and their assignment within the system if they're part of this program. But what happens next? The notification. Let's say we do have an activation. It's it. This is it. Stop. Something has hit the fan. You know? So we start reaching out to leadership and staff and send them different messages so they can show up. The one at the bottom left, that's the actual pod, and the one above it is the pod OC. So that's where the pod operation center is, that's where the leadership staff go and start essentially providing information and whatnot, you know, in terms of situational awareness. So you notice ArcGIS Online, that's where that little portion comes in. How do we get information from the pod to ArcGIS Online? We're not doing paper anymore, you know, we still have radios, if everything goes to hell, we can still radio and whatnot. But we need a better method, and this is what we ended up doing. The pod management tool. So this is essentially what we, I had mentioned earlier. People are assigned to different roles at each pod site. They manage the ins and outs. They're trained, whatnot. You know, stations under the administration manager. That's like a core team role. Essentially, the personnel, the communications, and the supply. Those are the three basic data points that we require at the pod operations center. And if you have 165 people radioing in at once, it can get a little complicated. So why not fill out a form? On paper? No. Let's do it a different way. And that's what we did. So we invested in Survey123. I believe a couple other agencies mentioned this. It's a form-centric application from Esri. It allows users to share and analyze survey information. It works on multiple devices. And yeah, it downloads straight to the form, you know, to the, any mobile device, and data can be collected without connectivity as well. So it can be uploaded later on. Okay, so. Just a little bit of background, the users select the tile, the event is controlled by the operations center, this is important, so users can't play around with what they're working with. We define the event and they fill it out. The borough and pod are selected and reporting is conducted. Now why is there a blank space there? Oh, that's right. I forgot my mid-90s animations. So, I'm going to try to play this demo. I don't know if I can do it. I will. Is there a play button? Oh wait, I think it's working. So I tried to record this yesterday. I think it's working. Oh, oh hit the image. Oh, oh, I think I just skipped through it, sorry. That delay was, I think, for me to explain what I was doing. <laughs> so, you know, we, we come up with different forms, deliveries, inventory, these are basic data points that are required at a pod during an activation, also safety, okay? Yeah, so the basic gist, and anyone can do it, you don't actually need instructions, we try to build these as quickly as possible, you collect the information, notice at the top, they cannot control it, we decide to call this event the training, and from there, they would select their borough, there we go, I'm almost on time, site code, I believe it was, that's the one, and 
You essentially, it maps you to it so you don't have to connect to the internet since we store the coordinates in the form. So no matter what pod you pick, it'll know where you are. So in this case, this person is reporting operational readiness, a fancy term for what your pod stat is. And I hope they picked open to the public. There we go, we're open to the public. And pretty much, that's it at the pod site. You send this now and information gets sent to the pod operations center. Okay, so let's see what's next. So the basic data flow is from the smartphone or tablet, we're now moving to tablets and mobile device management in terms of our operations, but we also believe in emergency. <coughs> if there's a device that works, we'll leverage it in that case. Since we control all the users anyway at each pod in terms of their account. So the data gets sent into ArcGIS online, but then a Python script pulls it back into our SQL Server database, where we join it with internal DOHMH data and then publish it back to ArcGIS online. From there, the desktop, you can connect to ArcGIS online, do your own work in there, or we start populating dashboards at the pod operation center. So this is an example of one. And I guess I put a few other ones. So form count, this is again, basic deliverables that we have, or data points that we require, how many forms and numbers of boxes are available at each pod. You can see that red means it's bad, yellow means it's not great. I guess I didn't put any fake green data, which means it's great, you know, things are going well. Another one is MedCount. Again, Doxy and Cipro are the two basic prophylaxis, you know, medicines that are used for an anthrax, but it could depend on the situation. We could be doing a vaccine pod, we could be doing many different other types of pods that are public health aware. Okay, so how do we share that information with the public? How does someone from the, how does a member of the public know that a pod is open and what can they do to get there? And what can we do to do whatever is needed over there to get their meds? Well, we didn't create a pod locator. So do it mentioned it earlier for those that stayed in the very beginning. They mentioned, you know, uh, what we're working with them on and we created a public facing web app that's linked on the DOHMH site. I forgot to put the URL. Definitely add that later and allows members of the public to search and find high sites near them. And they can view information such as the operation status and the wait time in each pod. So, oh, I did put the URL, I apologize. So yeah, this is a basic map of whether a pod is open. Close, notice that it follows the same format that Dewitt mentioned and a few other agencies were also presenting. We use the same technology. Anything from that phone gets sent over there eventually, which is really cool that we're able to integrate all the different pieces from the site to the operations center, to the members of the public as well, everyone being able to see the data. And just like uh, they mentioned, it's ADA compliant. I think Section 508 is the exact terminology that we use, where someone can use a screen reader or use you know, public transit directions. And we also provide tips, you know, prepare for your visit, you know, for a member of the public to provide whatever forms or whatever is needed so they can get their meds as soon as, as possible. Okay, so some future steps. For the actual GIS portion, apply a more equity-based framework for pod placement. Notice we use population density. There are other variables. We didn't look into ADA issues. We didn't look into accessibility. We didn't look into mass transit location. We didn't look into any of that information. We just looked basically at where the densest areas are. So maybe our pod sites are not cited in the best ways possible. It's something to definitely look into. And finally, recruit from city agencies. I mentioned PICO earlier, just barely. That's a, we work with 20 something agencies on that and we're trying to do that for pods as well. We work with those same partner agencies to recruit staff from those agencies as well to work in our pod program. From the forms, consolidate the forms for ease of use. Some of them can be convoluted. Those are legacy of paper forms that we tried to combine into one digital form. We're trying to work in, in you know, and essentially consolidate them. Revise them. We do drills, we're required to do drills. If things don't go well, we need to do a hot wash and figure out what happened and then make our modifications after the fact. And incorporate notification structures. So Survey123 integrates really well with notification systems. And also since the agencies all have Microsoft contracts where you can do Microsoft Flow to send notifications to staff depending on the situation. And our dashboards, aesthetic updates. I know the dashboards I showed you aren't the best. These are just things that we could definitely work on. Optimize the widget selection, and of course, user acceptance. And finally, for the pod locator tool. What we just showed you is only for the first 10 days. There's still more, 11 to 60 days planning that we need to incorporate as well, in terms of what is available to the public and what can be shared between the different agencies. And I believe that's it. Oh, no questions, sorry. <laughs> Okay, as um, next presenter is uh, Max C.
seen Clevin, the name is spelled incorrectly on the, uh, uh, on the agenda. Uh, he's the IT director for the May yes. Focus of Environmental Communication Committee for. I, get to, I, just, I just want to shout out uh, Sam Weir from Westchester. He's part of our network across New York State. So we're just not New York City Gizmo. You know, we're Gizmo, part of New York State, attached to Westchester County. Sam has been a leader in Westchester for 30 plus years. And he runs events like this for Westchester County. So uh, I just want to wait to Sam and say, welcome, glad you're here. And uh, so uh, I see you here, so I'll get your PowerPoint up. data in New York City as well as other environmental data uh, for New York City. Uh, this portal is uh, for uh, environmental professionals, uh, community members who are interested to see environmental data in New York City and those who follow uh, Office of Environmental Remediation programs which we manage. Uh, we, we, we custom developed this portal uh, using a Carta platform. And uh, so, I briefly will present you what we've done so far. Uh, just a little bit of history. Uh, Speed 2.0 is our second version of our application. Uh, the first version was developed in uh, 2010, uh, quite a while ago. Uh, it was a great application, people used it, uh, but it uh, was lack currently lacking some of the functionalities of current uh, JS technologies which we would like to utilize in speed 2.0. Uh, it's also mainly lacking uh, dynamic updates to our environmental data. Uh, application is really good, but uh, by the time we update data in speed uh, 1.0, it's already outdated, right? We need to work on another update. And plus, this application is great, but it was developed on older uh, do its web map platform, which soon will not only be supported at all. So we kind of had no choice but uh, to go forward. Uh, the, so here is a sneak peek of uh, our Speed 2.0 application, which will be available uh, next month. It's in, currently in the user, user acceptance testing. Um, here is how Speed 2.0 interface looks like. Uh, it displays information in layers on the right side, which you can see uh, it has many environmental uh, layer, layers, including uh, uh, projects within our New York City uh, OER programs, uh, cleanup pro clean projects, uh, as well as uh, other enver environmental databases from state and city and federal environmental databases. Basically, this portal uh, gets data from different sources and shows it all in one place. Um, you can you can also search for a particular property using standard. You can use address, borough block and lot, or you can just uh, pin down the city and select any property you like. Um, and you could see all environmental features next to this property, as well as you can uh, uh, drill down uh, uh, to the property profile. So each property have assembled information which shows a uh, bunch of uh, environmental features which uh, belongs to this property and which surrounds the property. Um, and uh, also, as well as environmental features, we show some resiliency information uh, such as um, sorry, such as evacuation zones, uh, wetland status, and the nearby OEC, OER and the uh, TDC at state program sites, which currently undergoing environmental remediation. Uh, so also, we can uh, here we can see the data. Same, you, you can set up a buffer, so you can see this is my site or this is my uh, property which I'm interested. 
uh, for example, if I'm a developer or a community member, and I can see all environmental features or environmental programs or environmental issues within certain radius, which is uh, very important. Uh, so you would see uh, you would see environmental cleanup side, the designation sites, uh, some uh, uh, facilities which uh, and the uh, uh, New York State bulk storage sites, uh, spills near the area. And you can see data in both in a map format and local local. You can also download it in a tabular format, uh, and then you can have it in, in Excel and uh, other programs you can open. Uh, also, you can um, also you can open you, you can create uh, a contact list of adjacent property owners uh, and nearby sensitive receptors and export it in Excel. You can use it for fact sheet or uh, for other different reasons. Uh, we also provide some more uh, advanced search functionalities. Uh, so you can, for example, you can select a property and or you can select an area uh, where you can find open spills, current open spins, spills or any other features. Uh, in this example I show, uh, I, I search for open spills in Queens Community District 6. I choose, I choose to search spills uh, with an attribute status open and which located in community district uh, 4 or 6 and you would see a few spill, open spills over there which were not cleaned up at, at the moment. Uh, and, and we also can provide data as I mentioned before in the map view or a tabular view if somebody wants to download it and use it for the further analysis. Uh, this is another example that, the, that um, I show here. I search for OER project with a phase in construction. So if somebody wants to see what cleanup projects City of New York currently does, uh, uh, so you can select the areas and see information about it. Um, so uh, a little bit about uh, a little bit about I guess soon this slide. A little bit about of data. Our data is in, in speed 2.0, it's not a stale data. Some of the data directly updates, uh, updated from uh, state and, uh, other, and city sources, right? Uh, also, it, we have dynamic connection to our uh, portal where with our projects, which City of New York currently manages, in the environmental cleanup projects with the latest status. So we pretty sure that the data will be up to date while we look at it. So it's a live data. That's what's very important. And I guess I'm done. <laughs> if you have any questions. Just an aside, Sharon, this could be useful for DDC, couldn't it? OK. Uh, I'm bringing up now um, the uh, MTA, um, and in particular the New York City uh, Transit Authority's uh, presentation by Simon Liu, uh, subway analyst, uh, GIS analyst. And uh, but before I do, I do want to recognize somebody in the audience from the MTA, Dan McHugh. Who, uh, Dan? Can you hear me? Dan, I'm singling you out. Uh, I, I just want to mention that Dan worked for the MTA and City Transit for decades and was instrumental in creating the first base map of the city in 1995. He spec'd out features for MTA and the Transit Authority and he also uh, played a critical role during 9-11 representing the TA in the Emergency Mapping and Data Center and he was a big champion of linear referencing for years before anyone would listen. So uh, he's, he's a real historical figure in GIS in New York City, and I just wanted to say hi to him and recognize him. What? Can I add a quick anecdote? Please. Uh, one of my favorite things that Dan always used to say back, you know, we're talking about, what, 10 or 15 years ago, right? Yeah. It's hard for a while. Um, and it's still happening today, which is uh, you can't bring a GIS knife to a GIS gun fight. And I always thought that was great because we're still fighting that battle. Everyone still awake? Yeah. You all hungry? I know I am. <laughs> <laughs>
we're getting to the end. Uh, why are you sending that out? I'm just a GIS guy that works for the Department of Subways, which falls under New York City Transit, which falls under MTA. We're complicated like that. All right. Today I'll be presenting Modernizing Work Planning at MTA and New York City Transit using Xbox Asset Management and GIS Linear Referencing. Uh, show of hands, who here is familiar with Xbox Asset Management? Oh, that's a lot of folks. How about Linear Referencing? All right, well, I'll go into a bit more detail on that later. There will be a quiz at the end of the presentation, so take notes. If you fail, you can't take the subway anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the difficulty we have in our agency is defining a standard where on our right of way. Where are the assets, where are the defects, where are the work orders? There are many groups in our agency that work in silos that have their own definition of where. There are also agencies that, sorry, there are also individuals in our agency who have the whole system memorized, but we want to make that knowledge accessible and standard. So with Import Inspired Asset Management and GS Linear Referencing, we are standardizing and digitizing MTA's WARE. I'm showcasing two web applications today, unfortunately not a live demo. The first is the Subway's Locator tool, which handles where assets are. These are some examples of our assets. The second is our back machine workboards, which handles where workboards are. But before I get into too much detail, let's start at the beginning. So you may notice, uh, New York City subway system started life as three private companies about a century ago. These were the hmm, Interborough Rapid Transit Company, the Broken Manhattan Transit Corporation, and the Independent Rapid Transit Railroad. There you go. As you can imagine, combining three companies into one resulted in our agency being standard and consistent throughout the city. Unfortunately, that was not the case as all mergers happen. This added multiple levels of complexity to our subway system that many other agencies around the world, transit agencies, do not experience, ranging from inconsistent naming standards and multiple types of measurements along the track. So to solve this, we're using Xbox Asset Management to create better standards and leveraging linear referencing to locate these features along our right-of-way. And if you're not familiar with right-of-way, you can think of it as our tracks and anything that's kind of confined in our infrastructure, such as a tunnel. So at a high level, Xbox Asset Management is the management of assets and its life cycle. You can use it to plan, optimize, and track maintenance activities, maintenance, <coughs> maintenance activities being an example of work order. Also at a high level is linear referencing. You create routes, sorry, you create geometries based on attributes, not manually digitizing, and we're going to be mentioning that a lot. What does not manually digitizing mean? Well, not in a traditional sense, we don't open a map, we don't click on a map to create a point feature and we don't draw a line to create linear features. However, it does all that for you, batch creates and batch updates. One caveat is, so with linear referencing is complicated, our measures can jump and you may reverse. You may have noticed we use a custom base map that looks similar to this. This always map that you're all familiar with is only a reference map, it's not drawn to scale. Please don't use it to try to measure distance. Not only is it used by New York City customers and tourists, but it's also heavily used by our staff for locating and planning. So we wanted to upgrade this map to something still familiar, but drawn on a scale. This is a map drawn on a scale. You GIS folks are familiar with this, but our staff are not so familiar. So by marrying the subways map and an accurate projection, we get this, our very own custom projection, rotated 29.5 degrees to give that familiar feel. Now notice some of the differences between the original and the custom base map. Central Park for one is much chunkier than the original. And the funny thing is many people actually believe that Staten Island is that small, but in reality, it's actually, it's actually much larger than Manhattan. So why is linear reference is so important? We're unique in that 60% of our tracks are on the ground, which adds many complications as I mentioned. Many of you are familiar with using GPS to locate your data but it's not fully available for us. We rely on linear referencing to locate our features above and below ground. Plus, LRS handles the inconsistent measures. The linear referencing is composed of root and measure. This is the standard that we use to define where, as always. Root is a concatenation of division, line, and track, division being the original three company names, line as in the engineering line, not train service lines, and track number. 
measure is uh, recorded in a standard Serbian format. You can think of it as footage from a zero point. So 12 plus 90 actually translates to 1,290 feet. So I think Hiram Mindful is a great example of route and measure. As you're driving north along route I-95, your measure increases from mile for 3.0, 3.2, and 3.4. It's a bit blurry. So linear doesn't just need point features. Sorry, it doesn't just need lag features. You can locate point features on a route. The example shown here is a point defect on route RTC2 at measure 1,290 feet. RTC2 being the track that the seventh service line runs on. And of course, line features. Linear features are drawn as a distance along the route. The example shown here is linear work being performed on route IVD3 from measure 1,000 feet to measure 2,000 feet. Notice that the EFMR trains can all run on track 3. This is why we use the engineering line as our standard for creating our routes, not the service lines as those can change. So why don't we manually manually digitize? It takes too much time, as you all know here. Besides our tracks and lines and polygons, we do not manually digitize any of our current assets, defects, or work orders along the right of way. It all gets created or updated by linear referencing. As an asset moves, we don't open, uh, we don't update in a traditional sense. We don't open arc map, start as a session, and move into geometry. Because can you imagine trying to move 100 or 1,000 geometries a day? Some of you here have probably suffered through that in the past, and probably still do now. We actually have to move dozens and hundreds of geometries a day on a daily basis, so we have to automate that process. So moving on to our first application to kind of solve where the assets are using EAM and LRS. As with most agencies, we're still very heavily paper-based. We have a lack of visualization and a digital capacity. This is a real example, by the way. Someone highlighted a paper map for work planning. There are actually still many groups that draw and plan for paper maps. But we're here to change that. Well, the subway is located to it makes it easy for users to locate the assets and plan out where they're going to work. Currently, they can search by asset name, track name, measure, and station name. So for example, if I were to search for JC Metro Tech, it will zoom us down to this area. The example here are our switch assets and red crosses and our signals as the traffic lights. I mentioned in the beginning how there are individuals who have the system memorized. I for one, I'll admit, I don't know where any of our 10,000 plus signals are, but with this application I can easily and quickly locate them. And what I really want to emphasize again is I didn't randomly digitize any of the 1,000 plus switches with the 10,000 plus signals. That was all batch created for the linear referencing system in a short span of time. You're probably thinking, okay, what if an asset moves or you add a new asset? Well, thankfully, that's what Express Asset Management is for. This picture is a crew installing a new asset over crane. So by being able to track an asset being added or moved in Express Asset Management, we can actually update the geometries with LRS in near real time. How we did that was we created scripts to automate the process of extracting data from Express Asset Management and updating geometries in near real time with RJS and near referencing. And these scripts went anywhere from five minutes to as needed. We've even taken it down to one minute. So now that we have solved where assets are, what about the work orders? That's where vacuum chains come into play. The vacuum chains initiative was started by the Subway Action Plan, enacted in 2017. The goals of the Subway Action Plan was to reduce train delays and improve overall services. Hopefully you guys have noticed that. Uh, a major contribution to delays were trash on track and track fires. So to combat this, MTA actually purchased three new vacuum chains which ultimately did reduce the trash and the track fires, resulting in improved on-time performance. This is a very high-profile initiative with daily reports being sent to service leadership on the length of track completed and the amount of trash collected. Again, paper-based stuff. The vacuum chains were actually originally reported on paper, but since the, but since the beginning of October of this year, they're now being digitized in our enterprise asset management system. And not only are they being digitized in our enterprise asset management system, the same workers who are reporting a paper now input directly into the system, meaning we cut out the middleman, right? You don't go into paperwork, and they go into the system. So on screen is a list view of the vacuum chains by clicking on a record. It takes you to a record view of more data. Now, Enterprise Asset Management is essential repository for assets, defects, and work orders. 
right, a single source of truth. This way, I don't have to scour through multiple databases throughout our 10 different agencies to run analysis and create reports. So of course, a single source of truth is already amazing. That's what we all want as GIS folks, right? We don't want to go through 10 different databases or 100. With this application, users are able to filter by date, by train number, by division. They would query. They would search like the subway is located to. So for example, JC Metro Tech again. By the way, the vacuum chain runs are the orange lines. We can see that there were vacuum chain runs recently in the past two months <coughs> at these stations. They can also create charts to summarize the length of track completed by division. And lastly, and most importantly, if a user were to click on a feature on the map, they get a pop-up with more details with the ability to click on a hyperlink that will take them directly into the Express Asset Management System. This application serves as a digital report for service leadership and also to replace the paper maps. So Enterprise Asset Management and Geospatial Technologies, we are modernizing and moving forward. We're taking steps to change that lack of digital visualization. We're making Department of Subways assets, defects, and work orders accessible for our agency. No questions? <laughs> department up here, Francis Cabibo, Chief of Strategic Initiatives. Um, I, I just like to, to say that uh, I was talking to Doug Williamson, he made a statement uh, a couple of months ago that, that basically said that the foundation of data at the police department was GIS, was spatially uh, enabled data, and um, uh, uh, I think that that probably applies where spatial is dominant in an agency to many of the agencies that have presented today. So uh, I know the police department has made a lot of progress. So welcome. And um, Neil Berman, by the way, looks like he's about to leave. Ben used to be the uh, director or the, the president of the Municipal Information Technology Association. And good to see you here today. Glad you were able to come. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Frank Cabibbo. I'm a GIS analyst uh, for the New York City Police Department. And today I'm going to share with you guys a, a, a pretty straightforward project we've been working on. Uh, it, it uses Esri's operation dashboard, and we are tasked with uh, creating a tool that uh, the executives within our office would use as a decision-making tool. Um, it, it paired with uh, the operation dashboard. So if you're familiar with that, um, it, a lot of this will kind of be... Um, not so, uh, it'll be familiar to you, but um, uh, what specifically, um, again, uh, I work for the Chief of uh, Strategic Initiatives, and uh, under that falls the Office of Management Analysis Planning, under that falls the Operations Research Section, and then buried within that is the Geospatial Analysis Unit. That's the team that is responsible for uh, putting this project together. <clears throat> So I, I've been with the department for about two years, and uh, a couple months after I was brought on, that's when uh, the, depart the, the department really got the ball rolling uh, in implementing um, Esri's uh, ArcGIS uh, Enterprise uh, department-wide. So this was one of the first projects that we were tasked with um, once uh, we kind of got things going with that. We, uh, <clears throat> And uh, again, the task that what we were tasked with the use case was um, to kind of test the capabilities of, of their application suite, specifically the operations dashboard, to see uh, if we could configure it uh, to be used as a, a tool to brief our um, executives and, and our chiefs within uh, just our office. So this is just internally uh, in chief of, in the strategic strategic initiatives. Um, <clears throat> So they would use this uh, tool to kind of uh, make to make informed decisions about either uh, policy planning or uh, resource allocation, uh, things along the lines of that. So in previous iterations of, of, of these briefing meetings before I got there, before um, as we, uh, we, we started um, uh, developing the, the enterprise system, they would usually meet every week and uh, kind of spill over comp set uh, cases different crime patterns, all kinds of st uh, statistics, um, that is uh, visualizations, what have you. Uh, and we do this every week in a, a, a meeting, you know, you meet 
were uh, creatively called, it was a weekly crime meeting, right? It was kind of all over the place. So that was really uh, our objective with this, was to kind of put all that data into one uh, uh, platform so uh, it could be picked through and used pretty easily. Um, and, and in regards to the, the prior iteration of these weekly crime meetings, uh, the GIS uh, unit was responsible for uh, obviously uh, creating maps and statistical analysis on these maps, and it was all done uh, uh, statically on, on paper. So we had kind of two sides to this project. The one side is developing that tool that they could use, and the other side is kind of uh, creating a, a, a product that we could kind of sh show to the other commands and uh, uh, executives throughout the department to kind of change, to really kind of shift that paradigm from that static paper-based map to, to something more intuitive, something more interactive uh, in, in regards to, you know, actually to, to web mapping and dynamic maps. So believe it or not, uh, <clears throat> with throughout the department, there's a lot of um, commands and units that are still uh, tied pretty heavily to paper maps, and uh, we really want to kind of uh, push away from that and raise the bar department-wide. <clears throat> so, uh, as I said, this, this method was kind of clunky, uh, and obviously there's limitations in that, so this was a, a good use case to kind of uh, uh, really kind of push the envelope and see what, what the operations dashboard could, uh, how it could be beneficial. Um, so again, the three, oh, you know, to step you through the, uh, uh, the process of how we, you know, um, built this thing or developed it or configured it, it, it's really driven by three main data sets. That's uh, our complaints, arrests, and shootings. Uh, and it uh, goes back a couple of years, and uh, all the queries and um, indicators on the map are kind of driven uh, by that. Uh, and also, we, we needed um, something where we could, again, throw a bunch of information. We're trying to throw a bunch of information at it, so it's just like a one-stop uh, one shop for all the data that the executives need. So it was really important that we could add levels to it, so not just points uh, on a web map, we need to be able to put our analytical layers on there as well. So uh, <clears throat> try to throw as much at it as we can. And then also another uh, 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 box that needed to be checked for this tool was it needed to be adaptable. Right? If uh, the day before the meeting the chief wants to see a uh, briefing on you know, homeless crime throughout the city or uh, uh, um, juvenile crime, it needs to be able to adapt that. We need to be able to throw stuff at it pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, with the dashboard, we, we, we've been able to do that with, uh, you know, throw multiple web maps in there. Um, and as this process kind of uh, snowballed and uh, got a little more uh, robust, uh, there's a need to automate the workflow um, through, and update the data through Python scripting. So uh, that's kind of um, the process we went through there, but again, you know, not only to, to kind of develop this tool for it to be used, we also wanted the finished product to be nice and polished so we could go out you know, through the department and say, this is what we have to offer, this is really what the bar should be, and kind of, as a department, try to get everyone on board to, to get to that level. <clears throat> So the next couple slides are just kind of screenshots uh, of what it looks like. I mean, if you're familiar with the operations dashboard, you're kind of familiar with its interface, uh, but it's customized to um, you know different time slices and indicators and crime sets that the executives are used to that, that uh, are broken down in a way that they could use their institutional knowledge uh, paired with this to make uh, informed, insightful decisions. Um, so there's different uh, precincts you could query by uh, all kinds of customization that, that pretty much uh, they would request. And again, you could continue to drill down, you could see the different data sets, the, the different layers in different light, and uh, again, everything's tied to that, so you throw it on citywide, and then your numbers are going to change for the data set, so this is, for example, is complaints, robbery complaints, you saw the indicators change, uh, we have different graphics as well. And you know you could drill down even further. So uh, in the same kind of uh, breath, you can take a, a, a big picture look, a macro look, a, a, like a snapshot of what's going on citywide. You could also drill down on the micro level and see uh, kind of what's driving crime on a, on a neighborhood level. That's really important. Um, and as for moving forward, uh, department-wise and, and within our unit, uh, we have a need to develop these dashboards and, and, and uh, be able to kind of get them out to uh, an operational level so commanders uh, in precincts could use them as well as the guys 
on patrol. Uh, eventually, that's something we want to develop, not only with the operations dashboard, but with the other apps that, that, that the Esri Enterprise uh, offers. Um, and with that comes the need to uh, have live fed data to these uh, apps and uh, uh, dashboards. Uh, so we're working on that as well. And um, again, uh, as mentioned before, we're, we're really trying to push uh, this, you know, this paradigm shift department wide and raise the raise the bar and uh, really stand up the, the, the enterprise system department wide so it can be used operationally, not not only on the top level but but all the way through the department down down to the patrol uh, level as well. So, uh, anyone has any questions? Um, thank you for uh, sticking around. Uh, and have a nice day. Uh, this really brings the program to an end, and uh, we came in on time, and I don't think there was one malfunction in my laptop, so kudos to me. Um, I, I think when we think about the uh, variety of different kinds of applications from 3D to linear referencing to all the dashboards and on and on and on, you can really say that when we talk about IT in New York City, what we're really talking about is applications, service applications that are GIS dominant. That GIS, the form of GIS uh, for service delivery and for analytics is really driven by GIS. And I would just note, as sort of president of Gizmo, that the time has really come for GIS to assume its place in the pantheon of IT technologies. It does not have the status as other kinds of technologies do in the city, and uh, both for our sake now and for the future when GIS is just going to grow in power, we really need to assume a place uh, where, where we belong based on what GIS is delivering. So uh, please, if you're not a Gizmo member, join and help us do this, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get somewhere before too long. I just want to note that Wendy Dorf has the uh, attendance sheet if you haven't signed in. Be very useful to document the fact that you are here. Um, so Wendy, you want to go by the door and make sure you get everyone. And then uh, there was one more thing I was reminded to do. Oh yeah, would all the speakers who remain come up front so we can take a group photo of uh, everyone who spoke and also Gizmo board members as well come up. I know Wendy, that puts you in a box, but, uh, but so all speakers, please come up. Thank you very much for coming.